Okay, guys, first I want to see if you have any questions about the new homework assignment. Did you have a chance of uh, uh, checking out, uh, downloading the uh, micro tech simulator from the web? Uh, from the, uh, you have not done that, but it looks like Django, did you do that? It's, it's okay, all right, works, all right, good. All right, um, let's start by, uh, with a quick review of what we did uh, in the last lecture, we uh, finished uh, section 9.1, which is uh, the first uh, step of a two-step process. That is, we found a, a way to uh, relate channel lengths, oxide thickness, drain voltage, gate voltage, etc., to the maximum electric field. And specifically, it's this equation that we, we derive, EM equal to VD minus VD set, L prime plus L of LDD effective, right? And we made a point that EM is really proportional to VD minus VD set, as in depicted here graphically. This is VD minus VD set. So EM is proportional to this quantity. So clearly we can see in this case, let's say, case A would have a higher field than case B, right? Okay. And uh, L prime may be expressed as 3 T ox xj square root or 0.2 T ox one third xj one half from some experimental or simulation studies. Now we're ready to look at the second half of the problem, that is, given EM, suppose we know EM, we tell you it's 3 times 10 to the 5 volt per centimeter. Then can we understand or figure out what kind of substrate current uh, we should expect and uh, how much degradation of the uh, IV will happen, what's breakdown voltage, for example, all right? So we're going to do the second half today. Any questions? All right. We start by looking at substrate current. Substrate current not only is um, uh, easy to measure in some sense may be the easiest to understand in terms of the mechanism all right mathematically it does take a page to derive something but the physical mechanism evolves fairly simple that is as the electron travel from source to drain especially as it goes through this high field region the electrons become energetic and uh, they create uh, impact ionizations impact ionizations causes holes to flow into the substrate and it can be collected by a uh, contact and emitter and measured, all right? That current is called I sub. So I sub is really nothing but the number of holes generated per second times the uh, electronic charge, right? That would be I sub, is that right? Number of holes generated per second by impanization multiplied by electronic charge, okay? Okay. Now. This may be a, a review for you, maybe something new for you. In um, uh, solid state physics uh, or semiconductor electronics, we um, refer to something called impact ionization coefficient. And this is defined in the following way. Impact ionization coefficient is the number of impact ionization events by one electron traveling one centimeter in distance. In other words, if electron travels one centimeter in distance, how many electron hole pairs will this electron create as it travels one centimeter? Obviously, the larger this number is, the higher the rate of impactization. So it's called impact ionization coefficient. And the unit is number of events per centimeter travel, so just one of over centimeters is the, is the, is the unit. Yes. How does impact ionization impact uh, the drain current? Because you're creating electrons also in the channel. And while you measure I sub, which are the holes going down into the substrate, you're getting more electrons towards the drain end of the channel. Very good. So therefore, the simple answer to the question is, the question is, how does this impact ionization affect the drain current? I, I did say it immediately gives us substrate current I sub because I sub is the hose collected by the back contact or substrate contact. What about the drain current? The easy answer, the simple answer is that the electrons created by impact ionization will flow with electric field, follow electric field line into the drain. 
and join the the original ID. Therefore, now ID is increased, right? Increased by what amount? By I sub. Is that right? Would that make sense? Right? Because every host flowing out of substrate, there will be one electron flowing into the into the drain. So you may say, aha, that must be why the uh, IDVD curve looks like that. You know, IDVD curve says first we have saturation current, and then eventually the star seem to come up. So perhaps this extra quantity is really just equal to I sub. Well, I said that this is a simple answer, but unfortunately, it's not only simple, but also inaccurate. <laughs> All right. It's more than that. There's something more. Turns out this number is uh, automatically larger than I sub, if, if not more. And uh, I will uh, hold off a little bit and explain this uh, a little later, because I did have a page uh, prepared for that. Uh, if in the meantime, um, you know, um, uh, you get distracted thinking about answer to this question, so be it. I'll take a chance. All right. Okay. So, yes. So, in in the previous lectures, you talked about the velocity saturation in this region. So, uh, I'm kind of wondering if the impact ionization has some relation with uh, you know the phonon no. generation. No. These two things basically should be considered separate. And that's the best advice I can give you. Don't mix this thing together. If you really want to try to make a link, solid state physics can make such a link. This is what they say. They say when electron gets energetic, they can either lose energy through impact ionization or lose energy through some other means, such as phonon emission. All right? So in that sense, they, the two kind of uh, 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 so compete and uh, impede each other. In reality, the two have almost no relationship. The reason is that phonon scattering or optical phonon generation requires only 30, 40 milli EV, very small amount of energy. Whereas this impact ionization requires, you can imagine, at least the band gap energy, right? By the way, the concept of impact ionization in an energy band diagram picture would be this. An electron gets kicked by an incoming energetic electron from the valence band into the conduction band, thereby creating an electron in the conduction band and leave a void or a hole in the valence band. All right? That's called impact ionization. Is that right? So clearly, impact ionization requires at least 1.1 EV of energy. And turns out, as a result of some uh, um, uh, momentum conservation and things like that, you need a little bit more than that. And uh, you may recall some textbooks say it's uh, one and a half times the band gap energy. That's not correct either. That's overly simplistic. It's probably 1.4 EV, excuse me, <coughs> or so a typical energy you need for the um, uh, impanization to happen, all right? Okay. So f for this reason, these two effects are really quite um, um, unrelated. Because the uh, velocity saturation happens at very, I mean, the, the optical phonon scattering or generation happens when electron energy is low. So just about all the electrons participate in that. They generate a lot of optical phonon. That's why they cannot exceed a certain energy, therefore velocity saturates. So how do electrons get energy to create impanization then? Well, there's a concept called a lucky electron model. Actually, um, William Shockley, uh, Shockley first introduced that uh, that uh, uh, name, uh, that term. It's very descriptive. You know, there are always some electrons that are just lucky. They don't scatter, right? Because scattering is a stochastic process. So they travel a long distance without scattering, therefore not losing energy. So those a few electrons gain 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 .1 EV energy, right? So then they can create impanization. Okay, so uh, basically there's no relationship between the two. Okay. All right, but you can say if somehow that phonon emission process is even more efficient, then sure there will be fewer electrons that can have that 1.2 EV of energy, right? Okay. Yes. current increase, so how the source side can maintain this current? I mean, 
the south side, your carrier's number did not increase. This is a very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, um, you are following up on what I just said here. If this was equal to I sub, then there's no problem satisfying Kirchhoff's law. If I sub going out, your extra I sub going into out of the drain and everything is fine. But I said, you know, what actually goes out of here is, let's say, ten times more than what's come out of here. Then something must give. In other words, it will be nine times of I sub also flowing from the source into the drain, right? In other words, the source current must also have increased beyond the case without impedization. And you're absolutely right. So his question to me is, how can this be? Well, because there's so much questions, I might as well give a quick answer, and I'll still use my figure later on. What it is, is actually something we have mentioned before. When we talk about the mechanisms for output conductance, Right. In this region, we say it's due to the channel length modulation. This region is DIBO, drain induced barrel lowering. This side, we said it's because something called substrate current induced body effect. So what happens is that the substrate current, as it flows through the substrate, the substrate has a resistance to it, a resistor. That's called R sub. Is that right? So a bias, therefore, is established between the, 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 the material near the surface of the wafer to the bottom of the wafer. And it's in this polarity because substrate current flows in this direction. And the magnitude of this bias is I sub times R sub. Is that right? I sub times R sub. Does that make sense? Now, what's interesting is that the bottom is truly grounded. Similarly, the source is truly grounded because we put a metal on the source, put a metal on the substrate contact. But the body near the source is not at ground. Instead, it's at what potential? At I sub times R sub. Isn't that right? Yes? So now we have a forward bias between the source and body. When we say forward bias, does not mean the diode is heavily forward bias because we may only have positive point 0.2 volt, positive point 0.3 volt, right, across this. So now we have a forward bias, body bias. What will that do to the threshold voltage? Does that raise it or lower it? Lower the threshold voltage. When threshold voltage is lowered, what happens to source current and drain current? Increase. That's where this com is coming from, actually. All right? So it's not just that impanization current, OK? All right, so now you know the rest of the story, OK? All right. Uh, so, uh, so this diagram, uh, so we're talking about impanization coefficient. The unit is number of impanization events per centimeter traveled. And the symbol is alpha. Alpha is the symbol representing impanization coefficient. And alpha, you would expect, is a function of E, right? If this electron travels in a large electric field, alpha will be very large, right? Yes? If this electron is traveling in a very small electric field, alpha will be very small. And indeed, alpha is known to be a function, very strong function of E, so we normally would plot log alpha against E. And if you plot whether theory or experimental value, you find a curve like that. It's not quite a straight line, so we know alpha is not an exponential function of E, but instead it is constant times exponential minus a constant over E. So it's kind of an a exponential of 1 over E, all right? So there's a constant over E in the exponent. This is very common uh, functional form. A lot of electric field dependence, in fact, just about all electric field dependence we can think of um, have this form. Uh, in a semiconductor uh, behavior, okay? So it's good to remember this form now. If you see something exponential minus beta over E, minus beta over E, it almost gives you a, um, you know, exponential relationship in the sense in the log quantity over E plot, it rises, all right? It's not exactly a straight, straight, uh, straight line, it has a curvature downward curvature, all right, concave downward. And that's the behavior of exponential minus bi over e, okay? We're going to see this kind of function quite a bit later, so let's get familiar with that, all right? Okay. 
later we can even give it some interpretation why it happens to have this form rather than exponential plus b, b, b i times e, okay? But right now, let's just take this as given, all right? This is the characteristic of impanization, okay? All right, therefore, we're ready to write down I sub. I sub equal to electronic charge times number of holes generated in the channel per second. What is the number of uh, holes generated in the channel per second? It's equal to ID over Q times alpha times dy. Let's see what, ha what, what we were doing there. ID over Q is the number of electrons flowing through the channel per second. Is that right? ID over Q. Let's think about it. ID is a coulomb per, centimeter per, per second divided by a charge. You get number per second. So that number of electrons flowing through the channel. Is that right? Okay. Now, each of those electrons will create this many holes as it flows, th flows through the channel. Do you agree? Because alpha is the number of holes created per centimeter. So if we integrate that with respect to y from a 0 to L, we get a total number of holes created by one electron. Is that right? That's alpha dy. And that multiplied by the number of electrons flowing through the channel, id over q, give us the total number of holes created. Does that make sense? Is okay? All right. Have a question? Okay, yes, please. Why why you integrate from you know over the whole channel instead of a, just a pinch off region? Oh, I love it. We're going to later make approximation, limit ourselves to to the to the to the uh, pinch off region. Uh, but if I, we did that, I was afraid that one of you would ask, "Well, are we sure there's absolutely no electric field outside the pinch off region?" Now, this certainly is still a, a continuous function here. Even when it feels low, we still have some ionization. But you're absolutely right. You already see the uh, important approximation we're going to make later is that really the important part is you know, where we have yen, all right? So we could make some approximation, but let's start general, is it okay? All right, next, we know alpha has this form, ai exponential minus bi over e, and even ai and bi are known numbers because, you know, they're just like a, like a velocity versus field. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a characteristic of this material, right? Like velocity saturation. So we actually even know what AI, BI are. Uh, we can measure them, okay? This in the past, for many years, people have been measuring this impanization coefficient by using PN junctions to create a certain field and, uh, you know, then pass through some carrier, maybe with photon generating carrier and measure the impanization rate. It turns out, once we, 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 we derive an equation here, actually I sub data gives us the best way to generate uh, these, uh, these numbers. So these actually come from the study of MOS uh, uh, devices, but the numbers kind of agree with what uh, PN junction studies give us. Uh, however, the PN junction study in the literature give us quite a bit of range of the value for these, all right? So let's just take these two as given. They are the, uh, um, the, the, the parameters that describe the, the, the characteristic of silicon material, right? Okay. Now we're going to substitute this alpha into, into this equation now, into the in, in integral, okay? Substitute this alpha into the integral, all right? So therefore, and then we end up with this. I sub equal ID AI exponential minus BI over E dy. Make sense? Okay? All right, next. You know, the function is function of e, and yet we're integrating with respect to y. Now that's difficult. We don't know how to integrate that. So we're going to change the the uh, the the uh, the uh, um, variable of integration from dy to d1 over e. If we use d1 over e, then we can easily integrate this exponential form, right? Is that right? So how can we do that? Well, we'll find out how to express dy in terms of d1 over e. Well, we want to find out how to express dy in terms of d1 over e. Now, from chain rule, we know dy is equal to dy d1 over e times d1 over e. Is that right? Okay. So we have to, to evaluate this first differential. Okay. So we rewrite that as d1 over 
e, that's this divine e, by the way, okay, divided by, by the inverse of this. So d1 over e dy, okay? All right, now we're ready to, to do some differentiation. Because we happen to know what e is as a function of y, or, well, I guess I, I, I still miss one step. So let's first do d1 over e dy. D1 over E dy, if you remember the rule, is one minus one over E squared D dy. Okay, just see this, just do this. Differentiate this. See if you agree it's equal to the second circle expression. All right? Okay. All right, unfortunately, I messed a little bit of the next expression I really want to show you. So now, in order to evaluate this differential, we're going to use this relationship. We know in the pinch-off region, and that's the only place where this equalization is important, right? So we'll begin to use approximation now, all right? In that pinch-off region, the electric field is exponential function of y or y prime, remember? Yes? Yeah? Okay. So therefore, let's call this E is equal to a constant. This constant will be canceled out later, so it doesn't matter. I just don't want to carry this proportional sign. I want to change that equal sign. So I say E is equal to constant exponential Y over L. Is that all right? Okay. So now we're going to differentiate D, E, D, Y. Let's see what we get. All right. So D, E, D, Y is equal to constant D over L. Do you see that? Exponential y prime over l prime. I guess this should be l prime here, right? Okay, it's l prime. Right? They're all l prime. I don't see if I miss l prime here or not. It should be l prime here. Yeah? I guess this should be l prime. T. Maybe I should take away the prime. I forgot whether we use the prime or not. Let's all probably use the prime. All right. Is that right? Okay, finally, you notice. This quantity is just E itself. All this is just E itself. D E exponential Y prime L prime, that's just E. So therefore, finally, we can write this E over L prime. Okay? Now, after all that, <laughs> we substitute into, into this. You see, D E D Y, we substitute into this. We end up with D Y equal to minus E L prime, L prime d1 over e, okay? All right, take my word for it. This is okay, okay? You can uh, verify this uh, later, okay? So now we're going to replace this dy with minus e l prime d1 over e. So here we go. Minus e l prime d1 over e, okay? All right. Now let's take uh, the constant out. Co L prime is a constant. We take it out there, so we get minus I D A I L prime. Now what, what are we doing here? Uh, okay, E. This E, we again use approximation because E itself does not change very much. This exponential term is going to change a lot by orders magnitude as the as electric field vary, right? Is that right? But this E is not going to change that much, relatively speaking, relative to the exponential term. So again, as approximation, we take this E out of integral and give it a constant, put the maximum electric field there, because that's the point where this exponential quantity is very large, right? So that's the point where this integral becomes very large, okay? Just approximation. So then we end up with this. Now, do you know how to, what this is equal to? The answer is it's equal to minus 1 over bi. The minus, by the way, canceled out at minus in front, okay? So minus 1 over bi, exponential minus bi over e, right? Evaluated from electric field at the source to electric field at the, uh, the maximum. If you say, oh, it should not be that, it should be e subset, the electric field at the beginning point of, these, of the uh, pinch-off region doesn't matter because the next step will argue that, okay, at the EM side, we have exponential minus BI over EM. On this side, we have what? We have minus exponential minus ES over B EM. Is that right? Yes? But as long 
as this ES, I'm sorry, what I'm talking about, ES is here. ES source side is here, right? This is VI, sorry about that, this is VI, right? But as long as ES is small compared to EM, let's say a factor of two smaller than EM, in reality, e EM in the, in the uh, sample we did for you last hour may be as large as 10 times larger than the E stat, right? But let's suppose even EM is only twice as large as ES. Can you see that the second term is totally negligible compared to the first term, right? This exponential function, right? All right? So that's why we don't have this. We just have that, okay? See, ID AI over BI L prime EM exponential minus BI over EM. That's all we have. Is it okay? All right? And this just remind you, we know what EM is. So in the next beginning of the next slide, we're going to substitute this, this EM with VD minus VD set L prime. Okay? Now EM appears twice. I want to remind you, EM also appears here. So in this exponent on the next page, you're also going to see VG minus VD set over L prime. It's okay? You see that twice. So it's here. I'm sorry, the Xerox machine did not show this clearly. So I sub is equal to AI over BI ID, first EM now, VD minus VD set, okay? Then exponential minus L prime over BI not over BI, times bi divided by vd minus vd set. All right, so this vd minus vd set replaces the em that appears in the exponent. Okay, all right. Well, I don't think this is simple enough. All right, so we're going to simplify it for even further. Okay, now since a i b i are known, so we'll put this number in. We we'll find out the value is one point two units one over volt. Okay, all right. So we'll just say one point. So one point two is here, and then VD minus uh, VD set has a unit of volt, of course, that cancels out the uh, the unit of one over, over volt. We don't have volt in the dimension, right? Now, what's the numerical value of VD minus VD set? How many uh, volt typically? What do you think? What number would you like to use? Three ren? What, what what do you think is a typical number V D minus V D set? It's not a trick question. One word. One word is excellent. Good answer. All right. The point is that later we're gonna see when we change V D minus V D set, this exponential term is gonna change by many orders of magnitude. So this one is not in, uh, important. What do you call it? One, one and a half doesn't matter, right? So I picked about one point five or one point six, and therefore that times one point two gives us two. Right? But with today's power supply voltage, maybe one volt actually is a better answer. I agree. Okay? You know, I did this uh, several years ago, obviously. So if you call this a 1.2 here, one volt, perfect. No problem. All right? Okay. So approximately two here. ID is still ID here. Exponential minus BI over EM. I went back to EM because I felt this, this looks simpler. Separately, remember EM is equal to VD minus VD set over L prime. You remember that already, of course, right? Okay, so that's it. That's the model of I sub. So now let's plot this and think. If we plot I sub, in fact, we're going to plot log I sub because we expect this I sub to change by orders of magnitude. As we change VD, what kind of shape do you expect to see? Log I sub versus VD. In other words, what's the relationship between log I sub and VD. So when you look at this equation, it has kind of relationship minus exponential minus BI over VD kind of form, right? Yes? So we know in a semi log plot, it's going to be like this, concave downward. It's not a straight line. Yes? Okay, that's absolutely true. If you plot measure this data with a meter, you, you see exactly the shape, all right? Next, this is a more interesting plot, perhaps, because it's more, more, uh, um, uh, more well, let's say more interesting. So you, you n almost never see people plot log I, I sub against VD. People always plot I sub against VG. I think the reason is because it shows a peak, has a bell-shaped curve rather than just monotonic. So that's the only way people pl plot this curve, okay? 
And of course, they will, they will use VD as a, a parameter to the several of those VDs, right? The same if data could be represented here, just plot se several VG, right? We could have done that. But you never see people plot that just because it looks boring, I suppose, okay? So this is the way people plot this curve. Plot the I sub against VG. So you have a question? Um, wouldn't it be better to plot uh, log I sub versus one over VD? So oh, so so clever. You're ahead of me. I was going to suggest that later. But this is what you usually see when you, um, uh, when you look at the, uh, most papers. So the raw data basically is presented log I sub against VD, or more, even more often, I sub or log I sub against VG, all right? So we'll, we'll look at your suggestion probably in the next slide or so, all right? So now I have a question for you. Why does the second plot show this peaking behavior. All right, so I'll ask you two questions. Why does I sub decrease as VG increases, a large VG? And then later I ask you, why does I sub decrease as VG gets very small? So let's first concentrate on the first half of my question. Why does I sub decrease when VG is large? Why? Ryan, smaller what? <laughs> Wonderful. Ryan says, when VG is large, electric field is smaller. How did you uh, get that answer? And got it so quickly, speaking the microphone. Oh, I was just thinking if, if VG gets larger, then maybe you're, you start to go below threshold, and you don't have a velocity. Well, you don't have well, you have less velocity saturation. You don't have velocity saturation. You have you don't have the pinch off. All right, that's certainly in the right trend. I was hoping you would give me one of the following two answers. All right, once you say, "Well, I remember this equation." Right, as VG increases, what happens to VD? What happens to VD set? As VG increases, what happens to VD set? Increases. Therefore, yeah, decrease. That's one answer I was look, hoping uh, you would give me. Second answer I was hoping you would give me is to say, Yo, you remember this diagram, right? So for given uh, I, uh, VD, as VG increases, what happens to EM? Remember, this quantity give us, give us EM, is that right? right? Okay. So. As VG increases, EM decreases. That's why I sub decrease. Okay. Okay. All right. Next, why does I sub decrease uh, as um, as uh, VG decreases? As VG becomes very small. Joe, please. Uh, lower drain current. Very good. Indeed, that's how that happens. Is that when VG gets very small, current gets very small. Right? Eventually, in fact, you know, when people make this plot, they won't tell you what VG is. They always plot this just because they like to see the shade. They always plot into a substantial regime when current is very small. So the way I like to say it is that, you know, when, when, the, when you get into a substantial regime, you don't even have cold electrons to begin with, right? In other words, this ID, you see? This ID is the cold electron. That, that's, that, 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 that's, that's what starts the impanization. That's what initiates or that cre creates the, the impanization, right? If you don't have any electrons flowing between source and drain, how, how can you create an impanization, right? There's nothing to impact. Is that right? Okay, so that's why I sub drops, okay? So, so this behavior, it's interesting. It kind of tells us that the worst case for hot carrier problem, whatever that term means, Later, it will become more clear just what problem we're we talking about. The worst case for the hot care problem is not when VG equal to VDD. It's not when VG equal to zero, but rather VG somewhere in between, okay, uh, where I sub peaks. You know, that's where we have a lot of hot carriers, okay? Okay? Is that right? All right. All right. So quickly uh, uh, recap what we have done. I sub, we derived I sub this way, and that was the equation 2ID exponential bi over epsilon, and uh, it gives this peaking behavior, all right? Now, this is what uh, Sri Ron is uh, suggesting. Well, if you like beauty, I suppose, 
you know, look at a peaking a curve, that's fine. But if like, I hope this is not offensive to you, if like most engineers, we like straight lines, right? We can plot straight lines, then we really understand something, we extrapolate it and get a lot of things to it. So how can you reduce that data to a straight line? Straight line, right? How can you do that? So if you look at this curve, this, e this equation a bit, you figure out to get a straight line, you first want to divide ID to the left-hand side, right? Then you take log of both sides. So you plot log of I sub over ID. That's what you really want to do, right? Against what? If you take the log of this, right-hand side just becomes a constant, right? Divided by EM. And we know what EM is. It's VD minus VD set times L prime, is that right? It's this. So knowing it should be a straight line against this, what would you choose as the y-axis? So Sri Ram had a very good suggestion. He suggests the 1 over VD. That's not bad. But if you could plot 1 over VD minus VD set, then you get truly one single line, right? Meaning what? Meaning, if I change v, VD, VG, if we plot five different VGs, they will fall on the same line. Is that right? Yes? And other things that's so obvious to you is that if I plot this for five different channel lengths, L, is there any reason they will not fall on the same line? None, because look at this equation. Channel length is not up here. Right? So if you're uh, 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 like most engineers, you should love this curve, right? <laughs> Not only a straight line, it's a one straight line describe every bias condition you can think of and all the transistors on your wafer, all channel lengths, right? Okay. Now, let's then see what we, uh, we learn from this straight line. When we see straight line, we always ask about a slope, right? So what's a slope in this plot? Slope is simply equal to this L times this constant, 1.7, 10 to the 6. So slope is L prime times 1.7 times 10 to the 6. That's the slope, is that right? Yes? So now if you take a, a few devices, in fact, you can get this curve with just one device just by changing VD, right? But uh, if you want to be fancy, we'll do it for several different devices, several different VG, several different L, and just, just show off that you get only one curve, right? So once you get a curve from the slope, what can you determine? You determine L prime, right? Right? So you see, up to this point, L prime is either a theory, you know, square root of 3, T ox xj, or maybe some simulation, we might be able to find L prime. But here, we don't need theory, we don't need, well, we need theory maybe, we don't need any simulation. For a given wafer, you take this wafer from, you know, what company you're working with, you make this measurement, you can figure out what is the character, characteristic length in that, uh, depletion region, not in the depletion, in that pinch-off region for this technology, that's L prime, okay? You'll be able to get the value. It may be 126 N strong, maybe 264 N strong, you'll get that, right? Okay, so now you can see the theory uh, uh, is getting tied to practice, can use it. All right, you can even measure it. Okay, so here is the figure that I promise I'll show you. Now we're going to explain about ID part. What happens to ID? Turns out ID will rise by more than I sub. And the explanation is here. All right? The substrate current is going to flow from wherever it is generated near the source and drain. They're both very close together, right, to our channel device. So from somewhere near the source and drain to wherever the substrate contact is. Earlier, I showed the substrate contact on the back side. That's actually not a very good picture. Because of latch-up concern, we always put a lot of well contact near the surface. We want to short out those well resistance to, in order to avoid latch-up, right? So it's good to remind you, yourself that current actually don't have, does not have to flow through the back of the wafer. They flow to some contact on the surface. Nonetheless, this is going to be tens of micron of distance here. All right? And that's significant resistor, resistance. We call that resistance R sub. A bias is generated equal to I sub times R sub with this particular polarity, positive here, negative here, because that's the direction whole current flows. Right? Okay? So this means the body is positively biased with respect to the source. Right? 
because sources are true ground. We put a contact at the source. Yes? Yeah? As a result of positive body bias, Vt drops. As Vt drops, current increases. Okay? So this current can be many times larger than I sub. Right? But it is a linear proportional to I sub, and I can leave that to you as an exercise. Now that you understand the mechanism for responsible for this uh, ID increase, well, write down an equation for it in terms of I sub. All right? See what to, uh, you can do. Okay? All right, so as a result, R out will go up due to the channel length modulation, stay constant uh, due to the divo, and then eventually drop as a result of this particular phenomena. We coined a co uh, name called the uh, substrate current induced uh, body effect. It's not important. Nobody picked up this name, so you, you, you shouldn't either. All right, so this is due to substrate current, okay? And uh, it induced a body effect. Okay, any questions about uh, that? All right, so uh, don't worry about that. Okay, then let's move on. Yes, excuse yes. me. I, I wonder that uh, actually our inversion, the current still doesn't include the diffusion current, right? Actually, this um, forward bias to the PN junction were um, invoked the parasitic PN, uh, yeah, PN, NPN parasitic, yeah, bipolar transistor. And it will distribute, yeah, contribute a lot to the current. Very good, uh, Jean. You anticipated the, the next slides. What Jean is asking is this. Now, what we just talked about may be okay when we have a positive point, 0 0.2 volt for a bias. Maybe that's all right. Positive 0 0.4 volt bias, maybe it's okay. And by the way, even positive 0 0.6 volt is still okay because the uh, current injection is very small. But let's say you get to point 0.7, point 0.8 volt, right? Then electrons are going to be injected from this uh, source into the substrate and may be collected by this drain. In other words, this parasitic BJT, bipolar junction transistor. When that happens, doesn't something additional happen here besides that uh, substrate current induced body effect? The answer is absolutely right. So let's just look at that. Okay, the next slide, we'll talk about that. Okay. Now, suppose VD is even higher and therefore even larger I saw. Well, that junction will be forward biased enough such that electron will be injected. This bipolar MPN junction will be turned on. All right? Now, when that turned on, what happens? Well, it turns out more than just additional current happens, something even more dramatic happens. Just Jane anticipated maybe the current starts to increase rapidly. It does. But more interestingly, this current actually steps back to a lower voltage. And that's the behavior of bipolar, of MOS transistor breakdown. Not many engineers see this curve because typically engineers would, 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 would study breakdown by doing this. They will simply measure ID versus VD, right, by ramping the VD and measuring the current in an ammeter, right? If you did this, would you ever, would you be able to see this behavior? You won't. Because from this point on, your, 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 your next point of the measurement program is to increase voltage to here, right? Right? And what would, you, what, what, what would ammeter measure in that case? Current suddenly go to infinity, right? So this is what you would, would think about the breakdown. In reality, it's not that simple. It actually behaves this way. Now, can you measure this curve as I drew here? Is it possible to measure that? Let me give you uh, uh, that answer. Yes, it is possible. So how do you measure it? S sweep ID. Did you see that? Wonderful, uh, Boris. That's absolutely correct answer. So what you do is you sweep ID rather than sweep VD. Today's uh, equipment uh, doing either is equally simple, all right? The, the, the equipment we use to make this measurement will allow us to sweep this, uh, this, uh, this uh, ID just with one stroke of the key and we'll, we'll do that. So if you sweep ID, then you will see the whole picture. You'll see the whole story. Okay, all right. So then the question is, what's going on? 
first of all, it is, it's, it is the general trend, and therefore the name is called snapback breakdowns. You often hear this word, MOS transistor uh, exhibit a snapback breakdown behavior. So what is going on here? Well, it turns out what's going on exactly has to do with a property of this parasitic bipolar transistor. I'm going to give you a fact. I will not um, uh, prove it to you today, and maybe uh, uh, toward the end of the course, maybe I can uh, prove it to you. Uh, a fact is this, that is a bipolar transistor has two breakdown voltages, all right? One breakdown voltage is if you short the emitter and base, if you short that with a piece of metal, then all you end up is the PN junction of the base collector junction, base collector junction, right? That is one breakdown voltage that we call the BVC. I won't give you the, the usual notation. But let's just say BVC, meaning the breakdown voltage of the collector base junction, PN junction. That's the usual PN junction breakdown concept, all right? All right? All right? That's one possible breakdown voltage bipolar transistor. If you short out the base and the emitter, you get this breakdown voltage, which may be 20 volts, let's say. Now, if you don't short it out, you let the space floating, okay? Or even allow this to be forward biased. Making the floating is allowing forward bias, let me tell you why. Because if you allow this to be floating, when you bias this the way I indicate here, right, if the voltage is high enough, when this junction start to be forward biased, be, uh, I mean, when this junction start to become breakdown, meaning current will start to flow, right? Then of course current will flow between emitter and base also, is that right? Yes? And that's no problem because this emitter base junction is, is going to be forward biased. See, we're applying this bias, by the way, I should make it clear. I'm sorry, we're applying this bias because we're trying to break down the base emitter junction, right? If you try to break down the base emitter junction, of course, you put positives on the base side, and neg uh, uh, I'm sorry, negative on the base side and positive on the collector side, right? Okay, so in this case, Anytime the current starts to flow, the emitter and the base will be conducting a forward current. Is that right? Yes? When you have forward current flowing, of course, the junction will have a forward bias. Right? So if you apply, say, 20 volt here, maybe 0 0.6 volt here will appear here, forward bias, and the 19.4 volt will be here to break down the junction. Is that right? So under this condition, namely, when the PN emitter base is forward biased, there's a second breakdown. At that point, the breakdown voltage of the bipolar transistor is much lower than the base collector breakdown voltage, lower by a quantity that's about the cubic root or quarter root of the uh, a fourth root of the, uh, of the beta, the common emitter, a common emitter cur uh, um, current gain. Uh, because beta is typically quite large, suppose 100, is that right? Even if you take cubic root of that, you still end up with five, right? Yes? So therefore, this breakdown mode could be only one-fifth of your collector base breakdown, all right? Now this is why we always need a lightly doped uh, um, um, collector. Because you don't have lightly doped collector, your base collector, the uh, breakdown voltage is going to be so low, I mean, it's going to be not high at, at least, maybe not low, not high. But then your emitter and collector breakdown voltage will be lower than your power supply voltage. So if you want to have five volt breakdown voltage between emitter and the collector with the base open, then your base collector junction breakdown voltage better be 20 volt. You see what I'm talking about? All right. So that's a, that's a fact about bipolar junk uh, transistor. Now, we can, we're ready to explain this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this behavior now. So what happens is this, this voltage that it snapped back to is the lower of the two bipolar transistor breakdown voltage. Let's just call this BV, uh, BVE just for today, all right? This is BVE, okay? What is this then? This is the voltage, this is the voltage at which I sub times R sub becomes equal to 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 volt. Your choice, that doesn't make much difference. What does that mean? That means before that point, the PN junction, the emitter base junction is not turned on, right? There's no injection. 
this current is not, uh, bipolar junction is not significant. Another way to say it is that beta is zero. We're not, there's no amplification. The collector, uh, the base, when the base emitter is not turned down, the bipolar transistor have no gain, of course. At this point, the bipolar transistor is turned down, right, by the I sub R, R sub product, yes? And once the bipolar transistor is turned down, the transistor snap backs to the VBE, BPVE breakdown voltage. You follow what, what I'm talking about? Okay, so this is called a snapback breakdown. And the, the re we can still use this in a useful way to uh, uh, use our knowledge of I sub useful way. At least we know what determines this voltage is I sub times R sub. In fact, you can even argue, it's not very good uh, uh, way to argue that this voltage is pretty much more or less this VVC voltage, all right? Um, well, that's not such a good, I, I will not force that. So at least from our knowledge of I sub, you kind of have understanding what determines this voltage. So here's the interesting question for engineers. Do we have to make sure this BVE is larger than VCC, or is it okay just this, this breakdown voltage, this breakover voltage is larger than VCC? What, 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 what do you think? What's that? The second one, meaning this one. Yeah. Just because, you know, uh, you won't get in there anyway as long as we stay there, right? Well, it takes a, a leap of faith to, uh, to, to, to accept that answer. Uh, cannot be proven, it cannot, but probably you, you want to be a little careful because, you know, in, in, in circuit there's always noises, spikes, right, inductance and, and all that. So how do you know it's not going to suddenly go in? Once it go in, it won't be just latch at this point. In fact, some company used to call this three-terminal latch-up device, all right? They were called a PMP injunction, some kind of four-terminal latch-up, in other words. Latch up is four terminal PNPN structure. Here we don't have PNPN, we only have MPN. It can still latch up, right? Latching away like that. So, if possible, you probably would prefer to design this being larger than VDD, right? But if you really cannot, well, maybe you can negotiate a little bit, let's see, and try it whether the product's reliable or not, all right? Okay. Another thing, just uh, for your general sort of discussion, even if that's not what we're concerned of, we are concerned about that, actually we cannot release a product with breakdown is only at uh, VDD uh, for the simple reason. Actually, there are two reasons. I'll first give you one simple reason. One simple reason is that many products have to go through a process called a burn-in. Burn-in means we'll operate this device for a short period of time at a voltage larger than VDD to weed out some reliability defects. Uh, short period, I weed them out, right? Kill this, those infant mortality. Then we, we sell the products, and, and uh, at least hoping, and in fact I believe it's true, knowing that the, the product now is more reliable than before the burning, all right? So you have to at least make this breakdown voltage larger than that voltage for the burning, right? And then finally, there's a second reason you cannot just make this larger than VDD and end there because there's a device degradation. We haven't talked about it, right? Even though the device doesn't break down, are you sure it can stay there 10 years and the device doesn't uh, change its characteristics, right? So we're going to get to that as we move on. Any question about breakdown? Yes. What happened to the rest of the curve? Oh, the curve, yeah. The after you hit I sub R sub goes 0.6 the first time, and you hit one breakdown voltage, what happens? Right where you're pointing, right? I mean, the, the, next, Here. the next point, yeah. What happened to what? What's going on? What's going on, okay. So once this happened, the bipolar transistor base emitter is turned down at this point. Once the bipolar transistor emitter base is turned down, the bipolar transistor breakdown voltage kicks in, which is a lower value, BVE, because the gain comes in. So therefore, the transistor goes into this branch of breakdown. And that's that. So if you run the uh, drain current, you actually see this whole curve. Okay? All right. All right. 
Now there's another interesting thing in this in this in this uh, figure. I thought one of you might ask me, but you didn't. You know, I kind of indicate that where the snapback happens, they happen at different VDs depending on the VG. As we change VG, this two curve are different VGs, right? They did not snap back at the same VD. Now, can you answer why? Can you explain why? At this two point A and B, they must have the same I sub, right? Because both these two points, this relationship is, is satisfied. I sub times I, R sub equal. So they have the same I sub, yeah? At the same I sub, in order to create the same I sub, do you need a larger VD or smaller VD when VG is very small? Remember the bell-shaped curve of I sub versus VG? I sub versus VG. What happens to I sub when VG gets very small? I sub gets small, right? So in order to meet this snapback condition, we have to increase ID. Yes? To bring I sub up. So therefore, the breakdown voltage is function of VG. Something to remember, all right? Okay? So if you simply do the simplest trivial measurement, measuring the breakdown by ramping this uh, VD at VG equal to zero and look for that breakdown, that's not giving you the worst case. Right? The worst case some, at some intermediate VG where I sub is the largest. Now, if one breaks down here, that's the worst case. All right? Yes? What if I now apply even larger VG? Can you see it's possible breakdown voltage goes back out again? Yeah, indeed, that's exactly this, okay? That's exactly the case. So it actually trace out this uh, contour breakdown point like that. All right? Okay, uh, questions about breakdown, transistor breakdown. So in this curve uh, shown at the top left uh -huh. on this page and the previous curve you showed, the, you're just drawing it under different conditions, right? It's not... Just drawing under two different VG, that's all. Okay. This one is VG equal to zero, let's say, right? VG equal to zero. This one would be VG equal to, uh, I don't know, to two volts, whatever, one volt. That's the condition. Okay, other questions? Yes. Thank you. In the previous page, Previous page. Yeah. I don't see the reason of having VDD larger than BVE. BVD larger than BVE, uh, you don't VDD see that. VDD larger than BVE. Wh why does it have to be larger, VDD? In, I see. In other words, why does this voltage uh, have to be larger yeah, than that? Yeah, I guess why we need a buffer. Right here? Yeah, we need a buffer voltage, but it doesn't have to be larger than BVE, or smaller than v BVE. Okay. In other words, suppose we design a transistor which happened to have very small, B, uh, very l large BVE, let's say. Suppose. That's what you're saying, right? Okay, let me give you a... Uh, yes. yes, continue. Uh, speak into the microphone. Okay, uh, you said which which point do you prefer for VDD, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I see. Yeah, should uh, this be larger than VDD or sh should this even be larger than VDD? Okay. Yeah. So I was saying that to be safe, you would want this to be larger than VDD. And you would like to have, uh, so, so VDD can be somewhere in between, that you are saying. Yeah. yeah? Okay. The problem having in between really is this. Suppose we operate at this point, right? This is where VDD is. So we happen to be biased in the transit at this point, I suppose, right? At this point, let's suppose for some reason there's a transient noise on the drain line, right? Maybe some inductive noise, something like that. Then it will bring this transistor into this branch, is that right? 
which means current will suddenly go to very large current. Not only going to large current, it will stay there. Even after this transient uh, noise goes away, it will stay there. So this might just mess up your, uh, your, your, your circuit operation. So if we can make sure that that gap is always larger than the noise? Absolutely. So there it takes, uh, you know, uh, the question is, what do you have to do in order to guarantee your noise will never be larger than one volt, for example? Again, as, as I'm saying, I, I'm not saying to you or proving to you it's not possible. And, uh, but certainly it will be even more reassuring if you can make this BVE larger than VCC. If you cannot, you just have to work harder, such as proving your noise will never be larger than a certain amount. I can tell you that task much harder test than designing a transistor with large, larger breakdown voltage, which is can almost never uh, <laughs> guarantee uh, the noise will never be larger than something or never be smaller than something. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. So those are some subtle points about breakdown. Now we go to a new section, and in a way, the meat of this chapter. I did say that the term hot electron effect is generally restricted to mean hot electron induced MOSFET degradation. It doesn't refer to any problem, you know, uh, having to do with breakdown, for example, or, or uh, um, other things that uh, I sub causes. Only having this name only refers to hot electron induced MOSFET degradation, all right? Um, I prefer actually to call this phenomena hot carrier induced degradation because I think it's more, more uh, general and I think it's more, uh, it's closer to the truth because both hot electron hot holes are involved, but hot electron effect actually is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the uh, standard name in the literature. You see people call it hot electron effect. They don't, they don't call it hot carry effect, although if you say hot carry effect, people will understand what you mean. They will accept it, but the standard name is hot electron effect, okay? Later you will see hot holes also is involved, okay? All right, so what happens is that you take a transistor, when it's fresh from the fab, you measure the IDVD, you get a solid line for a given VG. After a while, you know, just operate it for a while, a while may be very long, of course, at VDDs. It may take years before this happens. Actually, it turns out it doesn't. It only takes, uh, um, could be as small as a few weeks. You will find that the IV curve is visibly different now, okay? Let's say by the dotted line, just because you have been operating for a while. That's called hot carrier induced MOSFET degradation or called hot electron effect. Is it okay? All right. So why is this a concern? Because any time IV drifts, the circuit may no longer work, right? Particularly if uh, the, the current decreases, we can imagine the circuit will become slow. That definitely is a problem, and it's a reliability. So the question is, can we guarantee that the circuit will not cease functioning for, let's say, 10 years? Now, why 10 years? No particular reason, just because, uh, you know, um, probably no manufacturer would like to volunteer to say my product only lasts one year. You know, 10 sounds like a good number. Um, it's true that many of the consumer products don't last 10 years, right? But probably no one wants to advertise, you know, my product is going to fail in two years, three years. So kind of 10 years is common sort of criterion people try to, to, to meet. Is that right? So, uh, so that's the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the thing, okay? So in order to discuss the first, we'll have to d define lifetime. What do we mean by lifetime? Well, typically we define lifetime as, excuse me, <coughs> the time at which the device drift exceeds a certain acceptable uh, 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 level, acceptable, uh, 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 you know, a, a given criterion then we call lifetime has been reached. Now, wha how do we choose this accepted level? We often give them, um, um, uh, chose them in terms of delta ID over ID. Delta ID over ID. Well, clearly you know what delta ID over ID, right? ID is the fresh 
during current, delta ID is the change. So when a change is larger than, say, 10 percent, which again is a very common number, all right, yeah, then we say we have reached the end of the lifetime. You see what I'm saying? Yes? Right? So you have to just choose the criteria. We can later decide, you know, what's the justification choosing certain criteria or one or another. But let me just tell you, delta ID over ID is very common criteria, 10 percent delta ID over ID. Okay? Another um, uh, complication in choosing this criteria is where do you measure ID when you do the delta ID over ID? In particular, there are two choices. You can me measure it here. In that case, we call this delta ID linear over ID linear, meaning measuring in the linear regime. The other is to measure it at ID VD equal to VDD. In that case, we call this delta ID set over ID set. Now, maybe it's obvious to you, maybe it's not. Turns out delta ID set over ID set is generally smaller than delta ID linear over ID linear. So choosing delta ID set over ID set is somewhat more lenient definition of the lifetime, all right? And for fun, let me tell you that uh, up to five years ago, the industry standard is to guarantee 10 percent, less than 10 percent change in delta ID linear. In other words, take a more stringent definition. But you know what happened? Because of the technology scaling, no company can, could meet that anymore. <laughs> Then they start to argue, well, we don't really care what happens here, you know. The delay of the circuit is more determined by the saturation region current. Remember our model for the delay, uh, the, the, the gate delay? So knowing that those models can argue, if a linear current does not factor into our, you know, tau equal to CV over 4 times ID set, remember? So let's measure this at saturation point for 10 percent. Then all in a certain the, the lifetime is five times longer. Wow, that's great. Or in fact, it's more than that difference. So that's, um, that's a fact that truly happened. That also shows that you know, reliability is a very difficult thing to, uh, to, to define because you always have to build in some margins because you actually don't know device operation waveform that, that shows up on every transistor. So, so today, let's say, uh, delta ID set over ID set is the normal now. Okay, once a few large companies like IBM start using that, then floodgates open. You know, smaller companies decide, okay, if it's good enough for IBM, it's good enough for for me. And then this be, just become this, this the standard, right? All right. So, okay, the um, so that's how we define the uh, lifetime. Is it okay? Is it clear? All right. Next. There's the concept called the, uh, okay, all right, let's do it this way, all right. So uh, um, let's just move on direct to this. The concept called accelerated testing. Now we already said that in order to measure lifetime, it's very simple. You simply put a transistor at that voltage and then wait until you exceed 10%, right? If that 10 percent, if that time is longer than 10 years, you qualify the technology. If less than 10 years, send back to the device engineer, work harder, right? Such as uh, LDD, remember? What can you do to, to, to improve lifetime, remember? What can you do to reduce EM, remember? What can you do to reduce EM? LDD is the most uh, uh, effective way. Yeah. So send back to the device engineer, work harder on the LDD, and then we'll come back to test it, right? That's at least the way I, I, I ask you to think. But there's still one missing link. If truly did that way, and you truly try to measure whether at 5 volt it exceeds 10 years or not, then by definition, this test will, will require 10 years to finish, right? <laughs> right? And no one can afford to wait that long. So what we always do is we do something called accelerated testing. We never tested 5 volt if, if it is a 5 volt part. Okay, I'll use 5 volt part example here. Instead, we'll test the 7 volt, test the 6.5 volt, so on and so forth, so that we actually have, can have failure, you know, in a reasonable short time. How reasonable depends on how patient you are. Some companies are willing to take a few months to do this test. You know, others uh, want to see the data within a day. Okay, 
then you have to decide how much, <coughs> how high a voltage you use. This is called accelerated testing. So you never truly know the lifetime <coughs> for operating condition. Instead, you know the, uh, the, uh, the lifetime at some higher voltages. Then you try to somehow extrapolate <coughs> the lifetime at those higher voltages back down to the lifetime at operating voltage. You see that? Now, it turns out that step is very difficult. So therefore, I would concentrate on this last step. <coughs> the reason is, okay, let's just say qualitatively what do we see. Qualitatively, we know lifetime is a very strong function of VD, or uh, let's suppose we, we plot as function of VD. You're going to find it varies by orders of magnitude just by you know, 0.2 volt change in, uh, in VD. All right? Extremely strong function in VD. So clearly, you're not going to plot linear lifetime. By the way, this is not clear. It's tau, H-E, right? Tau refers to uh, uh, lifetime, right? H-E is hot electrons. Hot electron lifetime is tau H-E, right? That's the one we want to be larger than 10 years, let's say. So you plot tau H log tau H-E versus VD. Then you find something that's more or less just a straight line, but it's not straight line yet either. Okay? Then you can try either just try an error, or you remember, gee, you know, from that I sub study, we notice we plot log of I sub against one over V D, we'll get a straight line, right? V D is not right. So maybe applying this log of tau uh, H E over one over V D, then we'll get a straight line. And indeed, you start to get seeing something that looks like a straight line, right? So suppose you just say, therefore, I believe I can extrapolate. Now, this is what happens. So you're going to have one data point, let's say, at some high voltage where lifetime is only 10 hours. You get another data point where it's three days. And if you are one of those companies willing to wait for one month to collect data point, you may even have data point in one month, right? Then you find a straight line by plotting it against 1 over VD. And then you draw a straight line. And then you find where is 1 over VDD, right? This is your VDD, your power supply voltage, yeah? And you read there to see what is the lifetime at that VDD. Is it larger than or smaller than 10 years? Is that right? So that's the basic idea. Yes? The problem, however, comes to here, especially if you're not willing to spend one, uh, one month. You know, most people prefer not. They actually want to do some wafer level monitor to know whether something wrong is in the fab very quickly, perhaps even during wafer sort, we want to have some idea whether the hot carrier problem is okay or not. We may want to keep this data only within hours or something. Then we're trying to extrapolate this line over many orders magnitude, yes? So if you're a little off in this data, right? You can be way off, right? Or if the line is not straight, since we really don't know whether it should be straight or not, okay? And also, by the way, we don't know how to predict this, 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 uh, this slope. There's no serious says what slope it is. In fact, the slope is different for another VG will be different. Another channel length will be different. So you just have few points. You really don't know whether you're going to get an accurate uh, extrapolated test. So this is where some better theory come to help us. And the theory start from our understanding of I sub, all right? So we will not be able to finish the theory. We just go as far as we can and we'll finish next time. We start by reviewing the substrate current theory. Substrate current says it's equal to a constant. Let's call it a C1 right now, just constant. We used to call this numerical value 2, right? It's constant. So it's just C1. C1 times ID exponential minus beta I over EM. Remember this equation? OK. Now I want to make a, 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 a change. I'm going to change this uh, BI. Right, which has units of uh, volt per centimeter, is a constant. I want to change this constant or rewrite this constant as the into the ratio of two other constants. The, it's write it as phi i over lambda, and I'll give them a, a interpretation. Em is 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 the same. We don't change em. We're going to change this constant bi or rewrite bi as phi i over lambda. All right, there are two constants. I'm going to give them interpretation. It appears of making the equation more complicated. Actually, there's a 
reason to this madness you will see, all right? You, first, let me give you the, the interpretation of these two constants, and then we'll, we'll see why we do that. First, I'll give you the interpretation of lambda. Lambda is called hot electron mean free path. Hot electron mean free path has a unit of uh, dimension of length. It turns out to be about 80 angstrom for silicon, okay? Hot electron mean free path. And the physical meaning is simply the, the, the distance that the hot electron can travel on average before it loses its, its, its energy and become cold again. You see what I'm saying? It's hot electron, right, can do some really bad things, yeah? But on average, after 80 angstrom, it will become cold again, it will lose its energy. You see that idea, mean free pass? Is that right? Okay. Next, I'll give you an interpretation to the second uh, constant, phi i. Phi i has a unit of voltage, all right, or EV or voltage. It's the critical energy for impact ionization, about 1.4 volt. Now, this is the energy we said the electron probably needs to have in order to create impact ionization event, electron hole pair, yes? We expect to be slightly larger than 1.1 volt, larger than the energy band gap, right? Because things like band, you know, momentum conservation and all that. So it's about 1.4 volt. It's okay? All right. Okay? And turns out you will see the ratio of these two indeed is very close to that uh, BI we did. Now, why do we want to put this down? Because this gives us a very useful physical interpretation. Here's the interpretation. Let's see. First, look at the ratio of phi i over em. Okay, think about phi i, think about em. Phi i is the energy the electron must have, let's say 1.4 eV, 1.4 volt, right, in order to create impanization. Em is electric field. First, look at the dimension of this ratio. Voltage divided by field. What's the, what's the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the dimension? Voltage divided by field. Length. So let's think, some physical length that give a physical meaning. What the, what's the physical meaning of this length? That much voltage, that much energy, 1.4 volt divided by EM. Isn't that the length? An electron must travel in this electric field EM in order to gain this much kinetic energy. Because the energy gain is equal to distance times el electric field, isn't that right? Yes? So this is the distance the electron must travel in order to become hot enough to create ionization. Yes? So it's a length. Now, next, what's the meaning of this length divided by lambda raised to the exponent minus? It's a very common form. Exponential minus x over mean free path. This has a physical meaning. If lambda's mean free pass, then this exponential function is the probability that the electron can travel that distance x, yes, and therefore get enough energy to create independentization without losing the energy through scattering. That's the probability it will travel that distance x without becoming cold before reaching that x. Is that right? So this is the probability a cold electron will become hot electron. How hot is hot? 1.4 eV for this particular interpretation. Yes? So this is the probability a cold electron will become a 1.4 eV hot electron. It's exponential minus phi i lambda over yen. Right? Next, what is ID? ID is simply the number of cold electrons flowing through every second. Is that right? Yes? So doesn't that make sense? That multiplied by the probability of cold electron become hot electron give you the number of, uh, you know, hot electrons. And then CI is just some indication of how effective this hot electron actually give us in ionization, right? You see this at this level, the interpretation of this equation? Now, why do I do it? Why do I give this interpretation to you? Because once you know this interpretation, you can now write down many other equations for rate re equation for many other hot high left field phenomena without going through the kind of integration analysis we did to derive this I sub equation. I'll give you an example. Help me write down together without any math. The density of phonon, of photons created by hot carriers at energy H nu. Suppose we have a spectrometer, we measure light coming out of this 
this MOS transistor, and we interpret this photon as being generated by hot carriers having H energy equal to H nu. That's reasonable, right? If hot electron with energy H nu, then it has a chance of creating a photon with energy H nu without even knowing what physical mechanism generated photon is, right? Oh, right? We don't do that. At least the electron must have the H nu energy before it can create H nu energy photon. Does it make sense? So just at that level, can you then therefore predict what will be the power spectrum of the light coming out of this uh, MOS transistor? Wouldn't you believe, would you agree it should be proportional to the rate of cold electron flowing through? And then the probability electron will gain H nu energy, H nu EV of energy, which is exponential minus H nu over Q lambda times E m. Isn't that right? Sir Ram, you look uh, unconvinced. Are you, are you talking about silicon here? Silicon, absolutely right. And you're talking about photon? I mean, Absolutely uh, right. That's why I say, Sir Ram, I'm not even specifying how can hot carrier generate the, uh, uh, photons, right? But the fact is, it can, all right? And in fact, you know, we, we knew this because the student uh, making measurement, you know, he was uh, observing, making his observation. Um, he, uh, you know, because uh, making this very low level current measurement. We don't want light to shine on the, uh, the, 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 the wafer. So we actually cover the measuring, the, um, the, the microscope with a black felt, right? When we do the measurement. So a student, when they lifted the felt and looked under the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the microscope, and he saw yellow light. <laughs> All right. So uh, it actually was uh, the beginning of uh, several interesting uh, papers that we wrote on this. And uh, there are even some interesting questions. What, ca what can you do with uh, applications? Let me just answer the question very quickly. So we actually studied several uh, possible mechanisms. We proposed the mechanism we thought was responsible. It's called Branstrahlung radiation. Branstrahlung radiation simply means when an electron accelerates or decelerates, it's going to radiate. It's well known in the physics. And when electrons scatter, we fail. They, they, they decelerate or accelerate, right? And therefore, they radiate. There's no big pro no, 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 no problem, right? But still, thinking in the quantum concept, it's still better to have the energy H nu before it's going to do this, all right? But uh, other mechanism we actually felt was, felt was less likely, but subsequent other studies show they're more likely. So today, I would like to, to you just think that uh, the photon generation is due to recombination of hot carriers. If hot carriers, they have high energy, of course, when they recombine, that the energy can be released, all right? So therefore, you can not only have the, the, uh, the infrared light coming out, you even have visible light. And by the way, it is continuous spectrum, OK? So let me finish spectrum, and then I'll end the lecture right there. So what is spectrum is what we're doing? So it's equal to ID exponential minus H nu over Q lambda EM. So when you look at this, what is spectrum? Can you describe the spectrum? Do you expect to see more photons at low energy or more photons high energy? You expect more photons at low energy, OK? Because if H nu is large, you have exponential minus a large number, which is small, OK? Which is uh, probably intuitive. It's true. You get a lot of these uh, this, uh, this infrared photons, but gradually less, less. But actually, you even have blue light coming out. It's continuous dropping rather rapidly because of exponential function. People have actually successfully measured using spectrometer and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, confirmed this. That's another way to measure yen, by the way. <laughs> All right. OK. One way to measure yen. OK. All right. So uh, what we, when we come back on, on next, uh, oh, not next week, you get a, a, a break after the, the, on Tuesday, what we would do is apply the same concept to ask you to immediately write down a rate function of the generation rate of, rate of generation of interface traps by hot carriers. Okay, and we'll see what we go from there. <laughs>